Okay, guys, um, please let me know if my voice is audible. Just give me a heads up in the chat box, then I'm good to start. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, I already have questions coming up. So let me read them quickly. Okay, so guys, first of all, uh, because this is a free session, so I believe not everyone is my student, right? Some of y'all are my student and some are probably here just for the first demo session. So I had promised yesterday one thing that there is a free uh, WhatsApp group which you all can join for, you know, uh, things like get, getting study buddies or discussing doubts and all of that. So that link I've already shared in the chat box. You can you can make use of it. You can click on the link and join that global group. OK. Hmm. Um, meanwhile, I'm taking the questions. E-level through integrated MCOM and I want you to know if I'll be able to work okay. it. So I have a very uh, good question coming uh, from one of the students. Uh, she mentions that she has no prior knowledge of FR and she's been exempted from the earlier papers and she's directly come to the SBR. So will she understand SBR or will she be able to understand SBR? So the good part is that uh, I do not assume you have any prior knowledge of accounts, okay? And I try to do everything from scratch. So today being the first class, I'm already going to get into a very technical chapter and I will also drill a exam style question, meaning what actually as a past question was tested in the exam paper on this topic. Basically, we're doing IS-16 today. Okay, which is a technical topic, it's number crunching, but how it can get tested in SBR in a discursive element. I'm actually picking a past question. We will do drafting of a past question also today. So right from you having no knowledge to coming and testing and getting a flavor of writing SBR questions, we're going to cover this journey today. Okay, don't worry. I am going to give the basic explanations of, uh, you know, accounting as well. I'm going to give you the core understanding of accounting as well okay that much which is very important for you to be able to uh, link with the syllabus okay that base and core knowledge is what i'm going to share with you today now okay so there's a problem you are saying that it's saying the group is too full uh, okay can you can we share the link again as i'm not seeing it thanks okay Okay, so Vishnu, it's not started. It's starting in a minute. I was taking some queries. Yes, madam, can't join the group. Okay, that's unfortunate. Uh, anyway, uh, some of you are saying you all can't even see the link. So I'm just sharing it once more. We'll have to inform the admin team that the group is full and to, you know, do something about it. So by the class time, class ends, because today's class is long, right? I believe we'll already have an answer from admin team. Or next best thing what you all can do is, because if you all are not part of my paid group, then you all can punch in your phone numbers on the chat group so that I can pass these to admin team and they can get you added. Okay, that's the last thing that we can do. But wait, first let me get it resolved. Let me let me tell the admin members that this group is too full if they can pass a fresh link. Okay, message passed. Hoping to get an answer soon. All right, guys, so I'm going to share my screen. Hope this is visible. Okay, so guys, welcome you all to the first class of SBR. Yesterday, what we did was an orientation session. If you missed it, the recordings will be available on the portal. I suggest you all go and watch it. Reason, I have discussed the past paper pattern, what to expect out of this course, some other useful information. Even the planner was discussed yesterday, right? So it's a very good start or heads up to your course. So once it's uploaded, I request you all to please go and watch that. Now, like I promised, before I dive into IA 16, I'm going to explain the core concepts. Now, without this, without understanding the core concepts, it's very difficult to be able to relate with any other topics in the future. Okay. Now, even if you have done your BCom, your Masters in Commerce, or you have done your FR, you have done your FA, and you're decent. But if you have ended up memorizing stuff rather than understanding, okay, if you have ended up memorizing, then still SBR is going to become very difficult for you because SBR is something where you understand and then discuss the problems. You give solutions, you give advices, okay? So you can't give advices, you can't give explanations and solutions uh, if you've memorized things in the past. You need to have a clarity over the concepts to be able to uh, come to this position of advising people, right? Now, for that, I will start with some basics. I am sure everyone knows the debit credit rules. Probably there are some in the class who don't know. Don't worry. 
Um, now, if you know the debit credit rules, because you all know the in-depth concepts behind it, that's great. That's perfect. But again, if you've just memorized it using golden rules or any other concept, that's fine to make journal entries. I'm not discouraging. That's okay, because there has to be some way to you know go about with the journal entries. But beyond that, it's important for you to for sure know what the concept is, okay? For a quick, fast, you know, method, memorizing for the sake of journal entry is fine. But at the back of the head, if someone is asking a concept behind it, you should know the reason, okay? So if you don't know the reason, please pay attention today. Because in a professional course, after becoming a professional, you can't have answers like, okay, you know what? Um... Capital is a credit because that's a rule. So you have to memorize it. You, you can't have answers like that. You need to know the reasons behind that. Okay. So one, I just want you all to, I want to ask you all something first. What is the nature of profit, guys? Is it debit or credit in nature? What is the nature of profit? Is it debit or credit? You all can put it in the chat box quickly, guys. You all are in SBR. So I, of course, expect some answers from you all. Okay, great. So I have correct answers coming up. That is credit. Okay, great. But does anyone know that why it's credit? Does anyone know the logic behind it? Someone who is uh, who knows this just beyond memorizing knows the concept behind it. Okay, so I have one answer which is correct. I'm, I'm waiting for, I'm just giving you all 30 seconds more. If you all want to type in, uh, you all can try out what you're thinking if that's correct or not. Please put it in the chat box. Why I'll repeat the question. Why is profit credit in nature? What's the logic? Beyond memorizing, what's the logic? Okay, so just one correct answer I have. Uh, we have Dua who says that it's owed to the investors. Okay, that's the correct answer. It's owed to the investors. Now, this is a question which has been uh, asked uh, so many times uh, in real world or uh, it's even tested in interviews. But people fail to answer it and not cool, right? If you do become and if you are asked and if you if you fail to answer, it's okay. But not after doing ACCA. So understand now. You'll understand what Dua said, that one liner, when I explain this. So there's a very important concept, a very important concept of accounting called business entity concept, okay? Called business entity concept. From now onwards till your entire life, I believe you've, Picked ACCA because you want to do majors here. You want to make your career here, right? So this is your career. So in your entire life from today till whatever time you're there, you have to remember this concept. This is super important concept for your career. Business entity concept, okay? What does business entity concept mean? Business entity concept means that the business and the individual who pumps in money, who brings in money to the business. You all know that we say it's the owners who are bringing in money. The shareholders are bringing in money. If you start a business, then you're the owner who's starting the business. So you, that individual person and that business, they both are separate, separate, separate from what perspective are they separate? They're separate, separate from the perspective of accounting. They are not one. They are not one. Okay, they are separate from the perspective of accounting. Don't tell me from legal aspect, they can be sole proprietorship, so they can be one and all of that. I am not talking from legal perspective. Okay, I am talking from accounting perspective. From accounting perspective, strictly, they are two separate entities. So when the owner, the shareholders, when they pump in money, you'll know that's called capital. You'll probably have heard of it, that it's called capital. So the owner, when he's bringing in money, that's called capital. And because when the business is taking this capital, this money, it doesn't belong to this building. It doesn't belong to this building. It is something that needs to be returned back to that owner. It's something that needs to be returned back to that owner. Okay. So one thing from the debit and credit, I want you all to memorize. One thing I'm asking you all to me memorize. What is that one thing that I'm asking you all to memorize? Memorize that liabilities are credit items and assets are debit items. Okay. Just memorize this thing. This is what I'm asking you to memorize. That assets are debit and liabilities are credit. Meaning whatever has to be returned to someone has to be given back. Okay. 
is a credit item in nature and whatever the business owns is a debit item in nature so if you see the nature of capital because it doesn't belong to the business business is separate from the owner has to be returned back to that individual that's why it acts like a liability in nature the capital money the seed money okay acts like liability in nature that's why it's capital in nature okay so this you all have understood that why the nature of capital is credit because it acts like a liability it is not of the businesses but it's because it's to be returned back to the owner okay that one liner somebody had uh, you know uh, given uh, that was dua it's owed to the investor she didn't write owned okay she didn't write o w n e d she said owed to the investor meaning it's supposed to be given back to the investors is why she said it's credit in nature for profit that's absolutely correct why because guys when the business is taking in money what are they going to do with that money they're going to buy raw materials they're going to hire people the people are going to convert this raw material and then make it finished goods okay and then these finished goods are going to go out of the factory they're going to get sold when they're getting sold money is going to come in and when the money is going to come in the business is going to start to make profit right the business is going to start to make profit now who took the risk of putting in money and who could have lost the money is it this physical building or is it this individual owner can you put in the chat box who is risking the money physical not when i say physical building i mean the business okay the incorporated business is the incorporated business taking the risk or is the person taking the risk when i'm showing this diagram who is taking the risk the investor the owner the individual right terms absolutely right terms not the building not the incorporated business right so if it's this individual who is taking the risk if it's, it's this individual who is taking the risk then of course profit also belongs to this individual which means that whatever profit is coming in the organization that profit also has to get returned back to the owner it is not of the it's not of the businesses i told you anything that you owe to someone anything that has to be returned to someone is going to act like a credit item in nature so that's why my profit also just like capital is liability just like capital is liability in nature that's why it's coming on the credit side okay mm -hmm. so if till date you had memorized profit as a credit item today you know the reason why profit is a credit item okay now um assets i told you are a debit item and profit i want you all to take similar in line with revenue okay similar in line with revenue again it's the individual who's risking so revenue also belongs to the individual only so revenue is also credit in nature the opposite of profit and revenue would be loss or expense so is why you would take it on this side okay on the debit side that is again something that you will just take it as a opposite rule. now the easy way to remember this credit and debit rules see this what i just gave you right now is the concept is the understanding behind it okay but when you're doing journal entries you'll know that when you as a business or whatever you're in the accounts team you're at whatever position you all know that we end up recording transactions right we end up recording transactions and when we record transactions we have to know the debit credit we have to do the debit credit impacts very quickly we don't have a lot of time so every time maybe you don't have a lot of time to think about the whole background aspect so there's a way shortcut way i would say to remember this so remember this mnemonic okay what i'm writing over here you can make a note of it p l e a r clear okay so c for capital okay l for liability e for expense a for assets and r for revenue okay all those items that act like liability nature has to be returned are all credit items so first i'll do the memorizing rule liability is credit assets are debit now everything that acts like liability in nature is credit capital is to be returned revenue like profit in nature return so credit what remains is expenses opposite of revenue is debit 
okay so remember the cla are clear and with this you can do your journal entries very quickly if you have golden rules at the back of your mind you can do it fast from that way also it's okay but sometimes there are accounts which you're not able to think from the golden rule perspective as to is that a real account is that a nominal account what rule will you know apply to it it is time consuming because there are two stages to think here there are in many many stages to think it's very quick you have to think of the account what kind of account is it is it liability is it expense is it asset is it revenue or capital which five has it, it is going in and whatever head it is going in that nature will apply to okay so this is one of the best way trust me to do your journal entries now uh, like i told you please from today till your entire life you will not forget this word business entity concept and what it means that the business and the owner are two separate okay now um i just want to ask you one thing now that i have explained you this concept um uh, okay so this individual is bringing in money in the business that is capital so if i have to do a journal entry for this so what i'm doing is credit the capital because that i understood right if this guy is bringing in money so say for example dollar 10000 so that's going on the credit side but journal entries will always have a two leg impact right a credit and debit so what is my debit leg going to be if he's bringing cash what is the debit leg guys can you put it in the chat box can you put it in the chat box quickly what is the debit leg of this journal entry yeah cash or bank right depending on whether he's bringing bringing like a physical cash or whether he's bringing that money in the bank account so if he's bringing in the bank account then bank if he's bringing physical cash then cash so this is my journal entry which is absolutely correct now you all are very clear that asset to the business is debit in nature if you're spending that asset like if suppose you're saying if i say that um, a manager was hired for the business and first month salary was paid 2000 dollars okay first month salary was paid 2000 dollars so what is going to happen to that cash when i do a journal entry will it be on the debit side or will it be on the credit side if i'm spending it then will it be on the debit side or will it be on the credit side put it in the chat box it will become on the credit because i know that it's an asset and the assets are debit in nature but the opposite is happening with it you're spending it you're spending it so of course then it has to go on the credit side okay and debit side is what i'm paying salary salary is an expense in nature you all have to debit your expenses so debit salary 2000 credit cash 2000 so you all are very clear with the role of cash right now i have a very interesting question for you all uh, let me see who can answer it and i hope that this is a surprise question and no one else has thought of this before I want you all to think about it and answer this so you'll have seen your messages or i'm sure at this stage of life whether you're a student or you're a working person you all have a bank account right uh, you if you're really small like you've just you know come out of high school probably you don't have a bank account it's your parents who own the bank account which is fine but i'm assuming majority of you will have okay now if you have a bank account and whenever the salary comes in your account or if your parents are putting in pocket money what is the message that you see do you see uh, that the message pops as uh, you know 10000 credited in your account or 10000 dollars debited in your account if the money is getting into your account if the money is coming into your account do you see the word debit or credit you see the word credit correct you see the word credit this might be a little annoying that money is coming into your business that's an asset for you i mean it's coming uh, into your account that's an asset for you why the word credit i own it shouldn't it be an a debit item do you all know the reason the interesting question is do you all know the reason why it's why the message says credit correct perfect thank you so much so i have four people i have four people who know the answer that's absolutely correct four to five people know the answer that yes that word credit that is being used is from bank's perspective meaning for the bank it's a liability right for the bank if the money is coming into the bank account physically it's with them right physically it's with them whatever that virtual money or whatever they are in the possession of it while it's not theirs it is the customers so is it not something that the bank has to return to us so if the bank has to return to us for them it's a liability in nature so it's a credit item so that message that is coming to us is from bank's perspective not our perspective that's why the word credit 
okay that's why the word credit so to, from now onwards never get confused within the debit and credit field okay because these are the small things which confuse us then we tend to think tend to think that okay if the bank if this is the rule then why this bank message pops up why the opposite is happening there that's why it's important for me to give you all clarity okay so now whoever said that the basics are not good this is one very important basic and you should be good to start something okay you should be good to start something now like this like how the business entity concept is a very important concept of accounting this is one more concept of accounting which is important before i get into it can i request you all to turn turn on your webcams if you're at your workplace and of course you're not allowed to do it that's another story but let's get a feel of a classroom right or at least you know see we are already doing distance education and everything we're missing on the classroom fun so might as well let's make the virtual class a little more interesting please switch on your webcams guys everyone who's not working or in a position to switch it on please switch it on <clears throat> why do i see so many accounts with just one student that's very good like 10 names of one student anyway okay you all don't look beautiful today well come on i mean we all are in a very homey attire. That's fine. But okay, it's okay. Um, if you all are comfortable, then I'd request you all to please switch it on. Yeah, there are some people who have already done it. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Kevin, Lorraine, Ramya. Thank you so much, guys. And others also. Please switch it on quickly. All right. <clears throat> Let's proceed now. So the next important rule that I was talking about. Okay. Now. Okay. How do I put it first? Okay, so let's imagine, let's imagine that you own an apartment in UAE, okay, you own an apartment or you own a villa, whatever, because it's easier for me to draw a house, probably not a flat, okay. So yeah, so you own an apartment in UAE or a house in UAE, and um, you have a room, you have a spare room, which you can give for rent, okay, and for that per room, per month, okay, one room per month, you're able to collect against it. 1000 dirhams okay you're able to correct against it 1000 dirhams now this is the pandemic year 2021 i believe yeah 2021 was the pandemic year so yes this is your pandemic year now you gave the room to your friend uh, who has come to study in uae and uh, you were collecting you know 1000 dirhams every month now the whole of the 2021 has passed and then there is a friend uh you know uh, who wants to or who's looking to invest in UAE and is asking you that how much money are you making by letting out your room on rent? Now, the deal is in 2021, because it was the pandemic year, uh, the friend who was staying in your room could not pay the rent for December month. He could not pay for the December month. Okay. But uh, because the salary is delayed, because the salary is delayed. Okay. Now, there's another friend or another individual who wants to invest in UAE and is asking that. How much money do you make? How much money do you make in a year by letting out one room on rent? Now, you'll tell me, what are you all going to say? Are you all going to say that you make 12,000 dirhams? Or are you going to say you make 11,000 dirhams? Because you did not get one month's rent. What is your answer going to be? Are you going to say that the kind of money or the kind of income one room generates when you give the entire room for rent throughout the year, 12,000 or 11,000? What do you say? So none of you all, like there are five people who have tried to answer this, good six to seven people, but none of you all have told me 11,000. What you all told me is 12,000. Why? Why? When, when that guy did not pay you, your friend did not pay you for the one month, why are you all so keen on telling me 12,000? Why are you all not saying 11,000? There is a reason behind this. When you, okay. When you're accounting or when you're recording the income that you've generated in 2021 is basis what you deserve. Why are you saying 12,000? Because what you did is you did your part of the job. Your part of the job was to make that room available to that friend of yours for 12 months and you did it. So if you did it, you deserve full 12,000. Now, if he didn't pay for that one month, it doesn't mean you say that the income for the whole year is 11,000 generally for one room in UAE, right? That doesn't make sense. What you deserve is 12,000, okay? So that's what is one of the important rules of accounting, which is, which is called accruals basis. 
okay it's called accruals basis of accounting which means we record transactions accruals basis not cash basis there's another way one could have record for transactions one could have said income is 11000 but that would become cash basis and cash basis is not how we account for not in ifrs not in any other standards also around the world mostly you will never see cash basis kind of accounting accruals basis is only what you will see which is record as income what you deserve similarly the guy who is staying in your apartment somebody asked him what is the kind of yearly expense one will bear if one has to stay in uk for one in in uae if uh, you know for one year if one has to stay in uae for one year so again he's not going to say 11000 because he did just because he did not pay one month rent that doesn't make sense he's going to say 12000 is the expense right if one person is utilizing it for 12 12 months 12000 is the expense so same rule for expense record expense what you incurred not what you pay so this is the second most important rule of accounting i would say other than your dwell other than your business entity concept it's accruals basis okay it's accruals basis the second most important concept so from today till your entire life two rules you will always remember business entity concept and accruals basis and now you will be able to connect with the complex situations of accounting in future okay complex situations of accounting in future that's right i had correct answers coming to me as the cruel's basis that's absolutely correct thank you guys all right so now with this i make the move to the first technical chapter of sbr which is ie 16 there are some theory chapters also in, uh, you know, uh, to start with an SBR, like conceptual framework and all of that. I've given you all a very small gist of IFRS yesterday that what is IFRS and everything. I don't want to go into highly theoretical subject uh, chapter right now uh, because, uh, you know, most of us don't get hooked to theory concepts at the start. What was very essential to connect with the concepts, I have started with that, okay? The business entity and the accruals. We're directly jumping into the technical content. For sure, I'm covering conceptual framework, but I know the priority order. Okay, I know the priority order. So not now, but you can see in the planner at a later time, I'm going to cover the conceptual. So let's start with property, plant and equipment. Important standard. If you have been working, you know, you pick the balance sheet of any organizations out there. You don't have a balance sheet without property, plant and equipment, right? You talk about service industry, for sure, service industry have like, if I'm working for service industry like KPMG, the one of the major PPEs would be laptops because they give us all employees laptops to operate, the buildings that they own, right? Uh, let's talk about manufacturing industry. They will have factories using which they manufacture goods. So they even manufacturing industries cannot survive without, without PP, property, plant, and equipment. You talk about trading industries, of course, they will also have you know, office spaces or whatever, they will have property, plant and equipment as line items. So no organization will literally exist without I-16 PP item. I, I don't see how, you know, an organization can exist. Second, in the market, there are jobs also dedicated to, I would say around the standard, because there are, uh, you know, jobs which are around fixed asset managing, fixed asset managers, fixed asset accountant. What are fixed asset managers? What are fixed asset accountants? There are people who are responsible just to maintain the, you know, books around these PPEs, the entire story, because there'll be so many assets next level. It's it's complex in nature, many, many assets. If these are huge in nature, okay, if these organizations are huge in nature. So at any given point of time to maintain its right historical cost, yearly depreciation, correct year and carrying value with so much going inside it, you know, so many capitalizations happening or whatever. It is a complex job in nature. I mean, not that complex, but it, it can get complex because of the, you know, uh, volume, volume of it. So there are specific jobs around it is why I say that IA-16 is important. Okay, IA-16 is important. Now, what am I going to cover in IA-16 today? First, we'll understand that for an organization, what an IA-16 item could be. So definition, at what time are you allowed to bring in your books? So recognition, 
definitely at what value you're supposed to bring it in your books. That's important. So measurement. And lastly, when you sell it off, how do you do? Just dispose it. Okay, so all of these. Now definition. What exactly is an I-69? So it is there in your organization. You're holding it. It's held for use in the organization for production or supply. Okay, production or supply of goods and services, of goods and services, administrative purposes, or rental to others. Okay, when we talk about production and supply, I have very easy examples. When I talk about production, simply my uh, factory machine, which is helpful for production purposes. Okay, the land, which is helpful for production purposes on which my factory resides. For supply purposes, let's imagine the trucks that the organization owns, which will take the finished goods, which will take the finished goods. So that's one important thing, the supply of goods. When we talk about services, then of course, for services, you know, machines like laptops are useful. For administrative purposes, the office space, okay, the office space that you can see, or even inside the office space, whatever furniture you see, the electronics out there you see, all this, these are items, which are items of IA 16. But always remember that at no given point of time, I will be able to give you an exhaustive list of IA 16, okay? Meaning, I cannot say that for sure, in any organization, truck is an I-16 item. For sure, in any organization, laptop is an I-16 item. No, I can't say that. I can't say that. Why? Why I can't say that? Because yes, yes, for the big fours, for the big fours, we know what the big fours are, right? EY, KPMG, blah, blah, blah. So for the big fours, the laptops for sure are an I-16 item. But let's imagine Lenovo. Let's imagine HP. Let's imagine any other laptop manufacturing company. For them, is laptop an IA-16 item? It's not. Then what is it? If it's not an IA-16 item for them, then what is it? It's an inventory item. It's a core item that they deal in. It's a core item that they deal in. It's the inventory item for them. And for that, we have another standard of IFRS or another law of IFRS called IS-2 to deal with it. Okay. For laptops, we use IA-16 as a law. Uh, if it is... It is the nature that the company is using for production and supply of goods and services for admin or rental. But if it's a core item that the company is making or dealing, if that becomes a core item that it trades in or manufactures, then it becomes an item of IS2. Okay. Same way, let's take trucks, for example. Trucks normally is used for the production or supply, meaning for bringing in raw material or taking the finished goods. So for normally any organization, normally for any organization, trucks would be an item of PPE. But for organizations like... Uh, Mitsubishi or any other truck manufacturing organization, it wouldn't be an IS-16 item. It would be an IS-2 item. Do we have any other names which are truck manufacturing? Toyota, I think, that also manufactures trucks. Then any other examples out there? Do we have any international examples of truck manufacturing company? Volvo, yes. Volvo is one famous name. That's right. Okay, so... Renault. Okay, so we clearly understand the difference, right? That's why I say I can't give an exhaustive list. That, okay. Second, what is the other criteria that is to be met as a definition that it should be there in the organization for a period of more than one year? Okay, it's expected. It's at least expected that it's there in the organization for a period of more than one year. So if these two definitions are met, then yes, it's an I-16 item. Now definitions are important, okay? In FR, for you to just read the definition and just to keep it at the back of your head was good, was fine. But at an SBR level, you have to retain it. It has to stay in your head till the exam date, these two points. Because in SBR, I told you, it's 75% discursive element. If they confuse you, if they paint a scenario in front of you and they put some assets like that where they are treating certain assets which are actually inventory in nature or investment property in nature, and you have to justify and tell it that, no, it's a I-16 item in nature. How do you justify it? If you're a good consultant, if you're a good knowledgeable person, you will be able to state the standard. You'll be able to say, you know what? I-16 says so-and-so is the law and is why this is not how you treat these items. They are an item of I-16. If you're a good consultant, you'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, give reference. You'll be able to give reference. You'll like it, right? Even if you want advice from someone. 
even if you go to a doctor if the doctor is just telling you something that's fine because he's a doctor he's a professional it does comfort you but if he's able to you know give references out of some of some facts or, or if he's able to tell you some facts of some certain things if he's giving you a treatment that you know what eat eat apple and you know the so and so is going to get cured but if he explains you further that apple has so and so nutritional value and basis the research or studies so and so new friends are helpful for killing this disease or blah 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 then it gives you a level of comfort so if you're a good consultant when you have your clients and if you are solving your their problem if you are also able to quote the standards if you're able to quote the bare acts then yes it's it makes you more reliable right so in if in your sbr exam even if you are not able to say i16 property plan and equipment say so and so you should be able to say at least one thing either say i16 says so and so or say property plan and equipment say so and so one thing is what you will have to be able to quote okay one thing at least i'm not saying memorize the number and the name though it will get memorized by the end of the course automatically but i'm not asking you to do that deliberately i'm saying at least one thing you all should be able to quote and there are marks for that if you don't quote what the standard says i'm not saying word by word i'm not saying after held you should use the word for and after that use and after that in no say the sentence in your own words it's okay but say the sentence to the examiner say the sentence to the examiner the marks are for that you have to state the standard okay next at what time are you allowed to bring it in your books it's only possible to bring it in your books when it's probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity okay probable probable means a very high chance not 5% chance not 10% chance a very high chance that future economic benefits will flow to the entity okay next cost can be measured reliably so again at an fr level this could just be a something a line that you were reading and you could quickly move on from here without having the stress to retain until the exam date but not an sbr you, you have to retain these two points also till the exam date. okay you have to retain these points so i'm going to give you a cheat sheet if you all have attended yesterday's class you all know what cheat sheets are right i've summarized everything on one page so using cheat sheets revise it every day will take one minute or two minute to read the entire chapter and all this will be memorized till exam date without any effort without any effort. okay next let's understand how do you measure it okay so initially on day 1 when you're measuring it on day 1 when you're measuring it you will have to remember one rule okay which makes your life very easy which makes your life very easy what's that one rule you have to remember that whatever are the cost incurred in bringing that asset to location and condition all cost bring incurred in bringing the asset to location and condition are capitalized these two are very important keywords because after this if the examiner is playing with any examples you will see if that fits in this line or you will see if that fits in line in this line or not when i take for example uh, transportation for me transportation is normally a expense in nature and i would think it's a indirect item but see if i incur this transportation so transportation to bring a machine from japan to my country now you tell me is this a item that will get capitalized capitalized meaning will it get attached to the cost of the asset or will i expense it off will i capitalize or will i expense it off i'm looking for the word yeah i'll capitalize it right i will capitalize it that's correct if that's transportation incurred in bringing that machine to the location i'll capitalize it if it's purchase price of the machine of course i'll capitalize it if it's the tax that is paid which i can't recover back okay unrecover tax that i can't recover so again i will capitalize it if it's the import duties to bring it to my country i'll have to pay government a fee my local government a fee okay so again that is something that i have to capitalize so all costs incurred in bringing the asset to location and condition are capitalized second one more unique cost that you'll have to remember that is to be get, that is to get capitalized a dismantling cost okay dismantling cost now what a dismantling cost when you finish utilizing that asset you might have to wind that asset up now when dismantling cost needs to be capitalized when this is a obligation on you when this is an obligation on you and when will this become an obligation on you when you on day 1 have ended up signing a contract with the opposite party that you will have to dismantle this asset and that case dismantling cost the capitalized for example mining industry is a, is a classic example where you take acres and acres of land probably on lease from government or any other private you know organization or whatever and you're doing mining over it of course for mining you will set up some huge plants or whatever 
and after many good many years you might have to return the land in a proper condition you might have to remove your setup and go that being said for any place which you have taken from someone else you might have to remove your setup and go so that way from day one there is a dismantling obligation on you okay in such cases so if there is some kind of obligation that way then those dismantling costs are to be capitalized because they are same in nature like the first point they are same in nature like the first point they are costs incurred and in necessary in bringing the asset to location and condition why because if you can't afford this dismantling cost after the end of this project then you can't enter into this project then you can't enter into this project so dismantling costs are capitalized okay now let's look at some numbers Okay, so for example, I like I said, I've purchased the machinery, so I have a purchase price. I have non-refundable purchase taxes. All this will get capitalized. I have transportation cost to bring that machine, construction because I brought some parts and I have to assemble it. I have site preparation. I'm clearing the site, so that's also incurred in bringing this asset to condition. So yes, and then dismantling. Okay, but with dismantling cost, it's written that it's one point three three one million. Okay, these are in millions. So it's written that it's one point three three one million that I shall in future because it's his future value after three years. Okay, they say this is the future value of dismantling after three years. Now, I want you to tell me one thing: if I'm going to spend one point three million after three years, is the value of that one point three million today the same? Is the value of that one point three million today the same? Yes or no is what I'm looking at. No. It's not same. It's not same. Why it's not same? Because the power of money, because of the power of money, diminishes with time. Okay, the power of money diminishes with time. Which means that suppose if I am able to, because real estate is a very classic and a good example. That if you are buying a house today for one million, you know that after ten years to buy that same house, to buy the same house, you will probably end up spending three million. Now, why is that? the power of money has diminished because of inflation the power of money has diminished so is why that 1.331 million that you're shelling in future today you will have to shell out lesser amount for that so if this is the future value then dismantling on day 1 because i'm talking about initial measurement i'm talking about day 1 measurement then dismantling at day 1 will have a different value it will have the present value i will have to take this at present value so I will. I can't take this one point three three one. I'll have to find the present value for that. Okay, so I will quickly show you all using numbers how it's easy as a concept to understand how to go about this present value. Okay. Now imagine this is your zero, your day zero, meaning nothing, no day has passed. You have your end one, you have your end two, and then you have your end three. now imagine that the rate of inflation 10% okay so if you're shelling out 1 million today to buy something to buy the same thing after whole one year has passed you will have to spend more 10% of that 1 million because by 10% things are getting expensive every year by 10% things are getting expensive every year so 10% of 1 million extra i'll have to give up at at the end of first year right so 1.1 to buy the same thing after one year i'll spend 1.1 million same way when i look at the end of year 2 10% of 1.1 million i'll have to spend which makes it 1.1 to 1 million okay same goes for the third year so this will make it 1.331 okay now you can see what i'm doing you can see what i'm doing what i'm doing is to go forward to go forward to a future value i've been doing multiplication i've been doing multiplication okay so it's very simple if in the exam you're asked to come from present value to a future value you're not going to do sit and do this whole table of yours you have a very easy formula which is around this numbers only to find your future value you're going to start with your present value into 1 plus r by 100 raised to the power of n okay n is your years in this example 3 years r is your rate of inflation so here in this case 10% present value in this case 1 and future value is what the final answer you will get as 1.331 million okay you can do it actually sit and do it you will get that answer okay now understand one thing that if i wanted to go forward i was using the multiplication sign so if i want to go backwards what sign will i use guys can you help me with this 
If I wanted to go forward, I was using this multiplication sign. If I want to go backward, what sign will I use? Division. Absolutely correct. So you all are actually helping me derive the formula, which means it's on the easy side, right? Which means this formula is on the easy side to remember. So for present value, my starting point is, of course, future value. Divide it with 1 plus r by 100 raised to the power of n. Okay, and now do this. Take your 1.331 million on a calculator, apply this formula, and you will have as a result the answer as 1 million. When you're going backward, you will have the answer as 1 million. So dismantling cost, when you're going to capitalize on day one, it is not 1.331, but it is only 1 million that you'll consider. Only 1 million that you will consider. Okay, and you will capitalize. So what is the journal entry ideally that I will require on day one for this? Okay, y'all can go ahead and in the chat box start, start typing your answers for the journal entry and then just cross verify once I'm done if that's correct or not, right? So that's a good way to test yourself. So debit your asset or PPE for sure. What value for 5, 5.5, 7.5, 8.5 and a 9.5. So I'm going to capitalize my property, plant and equipment at 9.5 million. Credit is what, guys? Credit, what could I have on the credit? This is a bank, correct. So I'm going to shell out money. But am I shelling out the entire 9.5 million today? No, I'm just shelling 8.5 out of that today. What about the remaining 1 million? Where do I put the remaining 1 million, guys? Yes, it's a provision for dismantling. Provision meaning liability. Liability for dismantling. Why I'm saying it's a liability for dismantling? Because I have to spend that money in the future, right? There is a commitment with me and the other party that I will dismantle this at the end. So it's a liability in nature. So that's why credit. Simply because it's a liability in nature, credit. So credit that 1 million. Now understand that this is this liability is 1 million on day 1. Okay, On day 1, it is 1 million. On day 1, this liability is 1 million. But what if your end one was there? If your end one was there, this liability, will it remain the same or will it change, guys? Will this liability in my balance sheet remain same or will it change by your end one? I just want the answers. Just type in, will it remain same? So just type same or change. Same or change. So you're saying change. Absolutely correct. It will change. Guys, I have bought a future value of 1.331 to present value, right? And if I have bought something to present value, of course, when the days are going ahead, that value will change. It will keep increasing because of the inflation, right? I've un I have brought something to present value. It's shrunk in it. So it will get unwinded in the future. It will get unwinding in the future. So what I'll do is credit provision for dismantling. So if I apply 10% of 1 million, it is 0.1 million. So my liability will increase by 0.1 million. Where is the debit leg going to go? Because you all know that I'll always have a dwell impact. Now my liability is increasing in the balance sheet. My balance sheet items, assets and liabilities just can't increase automatically or decrease. They will root via p &L, right? If they increase in and decreasing and if it's not for a, a cash or a bank, then they will root via p &L. So what is this debit leg? Like Any idea? Absolutely correct. It's called finance cost. So it has to get into some expense line item. If my liability is increasing, then it's an expense for me in nature. So which expense line do you take it through? You take it through the finance cost line item of your PNL. Finance cost is a line item where normally you would put your bank charges, interest charges, things like those. So unwinding of any liability, it's most suited in your PNL. Not to put in admin, not to put in your cost of sales, but the most suited line is your finance cost. So is why you put it over there. Okay, like that at the end of year end two also, there'll be some increase in that provision for dismantling. And then at the end of year three also, it will become in finally 1.331 million and then it will finish off because you will end up paying that. Okay, so this is the concept of present value and future value. Now, before I move ahead, before I move ahead, if you all have any doubts, first you will ask, only then I'll move. Put in the chat box if you have doubts. If you have any doubt pertaining to this, this whole present value, future value concept, put it in the chat box. Sure, I'll explain the your journal entry. Any other doubts, guys? Okay, so you all want to know the double entry in the second year, we'll do that also, no problem. I'll squeeze in your in there in the whole sheet somewhere. 
Yes, the second journal entry is unwinding of interest. See, uh, even in fact, the year in one entry, if you see here, it's unwinding of interest only. Same way, second also. We can't put the future value now uh, in the journal entry. See, I can't put 1.1 million in my journal entry because already 1 million is recorded in my balance sheet. Putting a journal entry meaning it will just now have the, only the differential impact has to be there. Now, if I put a credit provision for dismantling 0.1 million, it will go in that ledger of provision for dismantling inside that 1 million and it will get added to it. Now, if I end up putting 1.1 million over here, then 1.1 million, million will get attached to this 1 million and it will become 2.1 million. Is that the correct answer? No. I just have to put the differential. How much extra should I add to it so that by the end of the year one, it looks like 1.1 million. That extra is only 0.1 million. So I can't put directly the future value here. The differential impact has to sit in there. Okay, the differential impact has to sit in there. Okay, so dismantling in a way as a concept is like site restoration. So if there was a site restoration also uh, as a concept in the exam, this is how you would treat it. Like if you have anticipated that after five years, you have to do a site restoration, that's an obligation on you, then this is how you would have go, gone about it. Just change the word from dismantling to site restoration. As a concept, it would have been safe. Exactly this. Okay. I'm going to answer other people, the second journal entry and explaining the first year and journal entry. Okay. So first year and journal entry, uh, whoever asked me what I'm doing here, see, I have recorded a liability on day one. You can see I've recorded a provision for dismantling 1 million. Why? Because I have to pay in the future. Now this 1 million dear is some value that I have brought to present value. In the future, I have to pay 1.331 million, but today I'm recording it at, as only 1 million because that's the present value, right? Now, after one year, of course, that present value is not going to remain 1 million. Then it will increase by that inflation of 10%. So I'll have to, in my balance sheet, show that 1 million as 1.1 million. How do I do that? I'll have to pass a differential entry for that. So what is the 10% of 1 million? 0.1 million. Okay. So I'm increasing my provision for dismantling by 0.1. And where is this going to go and sit in the debit line? See, increase in liability is like an expense for me in nature. So some expense line item and its finance cost the expense line item where it goes and sits. Okay. So I hope your query is cleared. For the second year, how my journal entry would have been. So I'll write it very tiny because I don't have much space here now. So my year two journal entry would have been now 10% on 1.1 million. When you calculate the 10% on 1.1 million, how much would that be? Or you take a difference of one point. 1 to 1 less 1.1. So that becomes 1 to 1, right? So that is going to make it debit, credit, provision, or dismantling. So have, why is my pen not working? I can't see it on real time basis. That's why my handwriting is not that bad. Okay, now what you're doing is you're doing a 10% of 1.1 million in the second year. The same thing is going to go and sit in your finance cost. Okay, so this is your year in two journal entry. So I hope that we have answered all the queries pertaining up to this concept, your initial version. Okay. Now, do you all want a break or I can move ahead? Do you all want a five to 10 minute break or can I continue? If you really are desperate for a break, just type yes, yes, yes. If not, then I'll continue. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to continue now. So th this is my initial measurement. Now, of course, when you're making financial statements, it's not only the first time that you record something. Of course, the balance sheet year incomes and then the second year incomes and the third year incomes. So of course, you need to know the subsequent measurement for everything. Okay, for all the balance sheet items, you will have to know the subsequent measurements. So how do you do the subsequent measurement? And in subsequent measurement, understand that there'll be uh, various type of expenditures that you end up doing on that asset. So what if you're doing running costs, meaning repairs and maintenance? What do you do with the repairs and maintenance, the running costs? Do you treat it like an expense or do you go and attach it with the cost of asset and balance sheet? Do you expense or do you capitalize? You expense it out. That's absolutely correct. So you will expense out. We will expense it out. Okay, so running costs like repairs and maintenance are to be expensed. Okay, second, what about overalls and major inspections? So major inspections are something where there are compulsions. Like let's talk about an aircraft. It's a huge machine. 
uh, which has to run. Uh, it requires safety of so many passengers which are traveling. It's a risky thing in nature. So probably inspection from every five years is required for that aircraft. That whoever that uh, you know organization is, if it is uh, Emirates, then Emirates will do a five year major inspection for its aircraft. So who's bearing this expense? Emirates is bearing this expenditure. Now this major inspection, what do you think? Every five years, if you have to do this. What is the nature of this? Do you expense it or do you capitalize? Yes, it's capitalization. That's absolutely correct. What about part replacement? Now let's take, for example, the aircraft tone. You know, aircraft is made up of exterior engine, inside cushions, uh, you know, exterior metallic body and whatever. So the cushions are probably being changed from every 10 years. So replacements like these, capitalize or expense, again capitalize. So somebody said, somebody has put a doubt that what about repairs? Do you expense or capitalize? No, repairs, when I say running cost, running cost are repairs. So they are expensed out only. Okay. Now what about enhancements? Enhancements means you're making a change in the asset in such a way that the productivity of that asset is increasing. Okay. Or the life of that asset is increasing. Either the productivity of life. Meaning in one minute earlier, if it was making, in one minute earlier, if it was making, uh, say, 1,000 units, now it's making 2,000 units. So that's increasing of productivity. Or say earlier life was five years, but you change one part because of which now the life is 10 years. So if such kind of enhancement is done, what do you do? Expense or capitalize? Capitalize. So this is simple. You all remember from your FR as well. That this is capitalize. So if you're tested around this or you're asked to discuss around this or some wrong treatment is given, then you have to quote the standard and say I-16 requires that overalls and major inspections are to be capitalized. And so the correct treatment is so-and-so. Then you suggest the correct treatment. This is how you will quote the standard. Next. Now, of course, for the further measurement of that asset, for the further measurement of that asset in the books, there are two models that are allowed. One is the cost model. Anyone knows the name of the second model? What is the second model that's allow allowed? Overall is, okay, I'll come to that later. Yeah. Okay. So two models are allowed. So one is cost model and the other is a revaluation. Okay. Yeah. So somebody asked me, what is an overall? So overall is, all, is, is in a way repair, but it's, it's major in nature. It's a huge repair. It's not like a regular maintenance repair. No, it's not a regular wear and tear. It's not a regular, but it's huge in nature. If that's, that's there, then it's called overall. Okay. So yes, two models are allowed. One is a cost model and the other is a revaluation model. Meaning after your, your day one has passed, now if you have to put it in your books, two ways you can put it in your books. It's at the discretion of the management to choose what model they want to. But once a model chosen, they have to stick to it because it's a policy. It's a policy. You can't change it again and again. Okay, So you have to stick to it. So just in case you have chosen cost model, then you need to know how to calculate under cost model. Under cost model, you're going to take the asset at historical cost, whatever was your old purchase price, less accumulated depreciation, less than fair. Okay, so it's very simple. Historical cost, less accumulated depreciation, less than fair. Now, impairment in detail, we have another chapter for it. Okay, but I'll do, do I'll quickly explain you all very uh, briefly that what is depreciation and impairment difference. Okay, <clears throat> depreciation is what depreciation is the writing of, of that asset. See. You took an asset, suppose you took an asset for $1,000. Life is 10 years. Now you are putting it in your books as an asset. But the benefit you are getting it for spread over 10 years. So with that asset, probably you are making goods and you are getting revenue spread over the period of 10 years. You are getting revenue from this asset spread over the period of 10 years. There is a rule of accounting called matching concept, which means benefits and costs are to be matched. Benefits and Costs are to be matched. Okay. So here, if I have revenue, what is the cost that I'm booking against it? There is an asset I have capitalized in nature. So I am not systematically writing off the cost then. So what I have to do, I have to actually systematically write off this thousand over the period of 10 years so that I am matching the benefit and the cost. That's why what you do is you do a thousand by 10 and you get a dollar hundred, which is a depreciation that you take as an expense in PNL. If you take it as an expense in PNL. So if you take it as an expense in PNL against the revenue, against the yearly revenue, you're booking that 100, 100, 100 as an expense. So what is depreciation? Is the systematic writing off of their asset over its life. But impairment is not that. Impairment is a sudden drop in the value of asset. I had an asset of $1,000. 
but it got damaged. Okay, now damage is not anticipated. It will happen suddenly. The demand suddenly drop. Not anticipated. It happened suddenly. So impairment is not systematic writing off, but it's a sudden drop. Okay, so they both are different in nature. Some people tend to think it's same. It's not. Same. So cost model is simple. You take historical cost, less accumulated, less impairment, and that will give the carrying value at any date. Now, yes, so Ashna, will you be asked to use any specific model? Yes, they'll always quote what model they're expecting. Okay, they'll always give the reference. Now, in cost model, there are, uh, when you use the precision, the precision itself methods. So, into the right side, you'll see you have a straight line method, you have a written down value method. You, this is the most common that you see. Okay, written down value method has different, has different names like diminishing, reducing balance. There's something about units of production also. There's not something you you know you've seen frequently. But in this case, if the asset gets worn and torn, like suppose for example, a printer, a printer has a capacity in its entire life to, you know, print only one million pages. Then I can't write off printer over a period of five years or over a period of ten years. I simply have to write the printer off in my PNL basis how much copies it's printing every year. How much copies it's printing every year. So that's units of production method. So depending upon the nature of that asset, is that asset getting deteriorated basis the units it's producing, or it has a generic life? Okay. So it's a method that you will choose, and then if you've choose one method, you'll stick to it. You'll not change it again. Okay. So example of impairment is, um. If you have a factory, so in your factory, of course, you have a machine. So I was saying you have a factory, and in your factory, you have a machine. Uh, and say in mach on that machine, oil spilled. Okay, oil spilled. So some parts got spoiled, some parts got spoiled. So that's a sudden drop. So suppose the machine was worth a 10 million, and because of this damage, because of this damage, the value has come down to 8.5. So this 1.5 million that I see suddenly in one year, this is impairment. Okay. So I hope you've understood this. Okay. Now we'll take one example. We'll do a numerical example to understand the difference between straight line method and written down value method because there are some people who are probably not clear about it. Okay. So let's quickly do that. Okay, so I'll, uh, I have the question in front of me. I'll read it and then we'll quickly solve it on Excel because that's the fastest way to crack a question. Excel. <clears throat> anyway, an asset was purchased for 10 million and has a depreciation rate of 10%. Simple question. I have used simple values always for conceptual understanding. 10 million is your purchase price. I would say historical cost. Rate of depreciation is 10%. What is the value after two years? They're asking me the value after use. Two years in straight line method and in written down one. Okay. Very easily at the top of my head, I can say if 10 million is the historical cost, 10% is the depreciation. After two years, what value will be based on straight line? Guys, can you all tell me quickly in the chat box? Like quickly without calculating, just by looking at the question. What is the value of this asset as per straight line method after two years? Yes, it's pretty simple. It's 8 million. How did you get 0 million, dear? It's 8 million. So anyway, uh, because we have to also do written down value method, that's probably not easy to imagine at the top of your head. So I'm going to quickly open my Excel where I've picked this question. Okay. And even straight line basis, I will do it again because I want to clearly show you the difference in two. Okay. I'm doing the first one. I can't wait for you all to copy because we have to finish the syllabus, right? So all these, y'all can copy it later. Y'all can do it parallelly, of course, no taking, but if your speed is fast, if it's slow, then of course, I'm sharing the sheets and everything with you all. Y'all can copy it later or you have the lecture coming up, you can copy it from the lecture again, okay? So historical cost being 10 million less depreciation for year one. We have 10 being the cost divided by, not divided by, multiplied by 10%. If I do it to 0.1, it's 10% total. So that's my depreciation for year one. So carrying value at the end of year one. Carrying value at the end of year one, which is nine. Okay. 
plus depreciation for your two. So if I do this depreciation for your two, can you all tell me for my depreciation formula, for my depreciation formula in my year one, I had taken 10 million into 10%. Now for my second year depreciation formula, what do I do? Do I take 10% of it? percent of 10 million. Now for my year two, do I take again 10% of 10 million or do I take 10% of 9 million? Do I do 10% of 10 million or 10% of 9 million? It's straight line method, guys. Be careful. See, I have mixed answers coming, which means, of course, not everyone is correct. So half of the class is wrong here. So good that I have a clear, you know, example for you all. You will, again, because it's straight line method, your depreciation doesn't change. It's still on the historical cost. So 10% of 10 million is only what you will take. Okay. So it's going to be still your 1 million only. So you have your carrying value at the end of year two as 8 million. But if I change this and I if I come to written down value method, I have my historical cost. So things don't change for the first year. It's historical cost 10 million. It's less depreciation for your one. Doesn't change. It's still 10% of your 10 million, which is nothing but your minus one. So you have a carrying value at the end of your one as nine million. So you can see it's absolutely the same what you did in the straight line method, same thing you did up there. But things are not maybe same from your two. So please pay special attention for your two. Now in your two, do I take 10% of 10 million or do I take 10% of nine? Now you all are correct. Now everyone is giving me correct answers. Now for written down value method, I'll take 10% of 9 million. So the question or the name of the method itself is telling you diminishing method, written down value method, reducing balance method, which means the depreciation is on that reducing balance, is on that diminished value every time. So this time I'm going to take 10% of 9 million and not 10 million. So it's not on historical cost. It's not on historical cost. Okay. So that way the depreciation for the second year is not same. Depreciation for the second year is not same. The carrying value will also be different. Will not come. So this is the clear difference between two, which I'll highlight for you all. I'll just highlight the important part here, which which is the difference element, which you all have to know. That is for the year two. Okay, so I hope this is clear to everyone. So normally uh, what happens is uh, the organization, the management will choose whether to use straight line method or written down value method basis on the assets depreciation method. Meaning if the management believes that this is an asset which depreciates higher in the initial years, and for that asset, you take written down value method. But if the management believes that no, it's a equal depreciation throughout the life, then take straight line. So it's at management's discretion, but management has to believe that that's the most suited method for it. Okay, the management has to believe that. Okay, for example, let's take cars. Now for cars, if you see the depreciation, the way the car is written off is not same. Why I say that? Because if you take a car from the showroom and suppose say it's for, you know, one, $1 million and um, you're selling it at the end of second year. Okay. So it will probably diminish by maybe say 25, 30%, okay, or 40%, whatever. But that doesn't mean that it's depreciating to this great extent in the third year, fourth year, and by third year, it has no value at all. So if you depreciate it by 30% in the first year, and if you take it in the second year, 30, and the third year, 30, then Almost by third or fourth year, it has no value only. But that's not necessarily the case. It's just that the deal with car is that it depreciates in the first year a lot. But after that, then the gradual depreciation takes place. So you have to believe, the management has to believe that for that particular asset, the best suited method is written down or straight. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is one thing. 
Yes, you can say that with written down value method, you will never reach the book value zero. That's that seems different. So slideshow. So yes, uh, cost model was this. Okay, now let's go to the second model, which is our revaluation. Okay, now what happens in the revaluation model? In revaluation model, you don't use the historical cost, but time and again, meaning not there is no frequency given by the standard that every year or every two years, nothing like that. But if you choose revaluation model, then you are going to assess at a certain period of time or at a decent period of time that what is the value in the market and after few few years, you will take that market value and then from there you will calculate the depreciation, new depreciation. Meaning you will not take it at that outdated historical cost because it's not the most suited or best met method for so many as. Let's take for example land. We have organizations which have started 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. That way their land is also that old. Okay, The land that they've purchased is that old. If you take the valuation of the land, historical value, then it has nominal value in the books, petty value, nothing, almost zero. But if you take the revaluation model, and if you tend to see what the revaluation model is, you the net worth of the organization will shoot up like anything. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that there is a chance that so many assets, uh, you know, best way is to put, it, put them at revaluation. But anyway, this is at the discretion of the management. It's not a compulsion on them to use cost model or evaluation model. It's a discretion, management discretion item. But whatever they are using, they'll have to then stick to it. Like if they're chosen revaluation, they can't switch to costs in the second and the revaluation in the third and the fourth year cost. They can't do that. They have to stick to it. And if you have done land of one place as revaluation model, then land as a class of asset in that organization will all the lands will be revaluation model. Okay, all the lands will be revaluation model. If you choose to, you know, for one particular set of trucks, if you choose to use revaluation model, all the trucks of that organization will be on revaluation model. So whatever the class of that asset is, entire class will be using the same model. Okay. Now, what do you do in revaluation model? You take the most recent revalued amount. Now, if that could be two years ago, three years ago, one month ago, whatever it is. The most recent revalued amount, if you are more, you can add the word here, recent revalued amount and accumulated dep depreciation from recent revaluation. So you can't have the historical accumulated depreciation, right? So from recent revaluation and impairment from recent, impairment, from recent revaluation. So whenever that recent revaluation has taken place, that recent revalued amount, depreciation from that most recent revaluation, impairment from the most recent revaluation, that will give you the carrying value as per revaluation. Okay. So yes. Now there's something additional that you have to remember in revaluation model. That is when you get the asset revalued, meaning when you check the value in the market, the value in the books and the value in the market will not be the same. So when you put the asset at a revalued amount in your books, understand that you're playing with the carrying value. You're changing the value in the books. Now, of course, you can't automatically just go and make a change in a balance sheet item. You can't just go and change it like that. If you're making a change there, it will be like a gain or a loss for you. If it's an asset where you're making a change and if it's increasing, it's like a gain. But if it's an asset where it's decreasing, then it's like a loss. So if you're making a change in that asset, that other if impact of gain or loss also has to get recorded. So if you're doing first time revaluation and if it's a gain, what do we do with it? You have to pay attention. These are some intricate concepts. Okay. And again, because it's SBR, you are going to discuss, you're going to advise around these concepts. Okay. And you'll see I'm taking a past exam style question specifically around this. Okay. So there is a revaluation gain. You you did, you checked what the revaluation value is in the market. You compared with carrying value. You see revaluation Price is high, the value price is high, so there is a gain. So what do you do with the gain? You take the gain, take the gain to OCI, to OCI. Yes. And what is OCI? What is OCI? If you may have to give the full form, guys, what is OCI? Can you all tell me? What is OCI? It's other comprehensive income. So if you have attended FR, you probably are aware of what is OCI. OCI is other comprehensive income. Okay. Now, why are you taking this gain to OCI? Is not the normal place for any gains or losses your PNL? Yes, that's right. Your normal place for any gains or losses is PNL. You have revenue, 
you have cost of sales, you have GP, you have admin, you have selling and distribution, and then you have any other type of indirect direct expenses, then you have profit for you, whatever. Okay, so the, the normal place is your PNL. But this revaluation gain I'm taking to another place called OCI. And what is OCI? It's nothing but the continuation of PNL. But there are certain items which you're not allowed to take in the main PNL. This is your main PNL, which will give you your profit for the year. You're not allowed to give impact of certain items in the profit for the year. You're not allowed. Not allowed. Is why you take it in the continuation of PNL to the OCI. And why would this gain not be allowed to impact my regular profit for the year? There is a problem. Why can't I take this? Because from PNL, items are passed into balance sheet. Okay. In balance sheet, you have your assets, you have your equity and liability. Okay, you have your equity and liability. And under equity and liability, you have equity under which you have your share capital, share premium, retain earnings. And the deal is my profit for the year travels from my PL to retain earnings. It goes and sits here. The problem is the shareholders, the shareholders will look at this account. Why? For profit. For profit distribution, meaning for dividend distribution, they will have an eye on this account. So if you take this profit, if you take this revaluation gain to your regular PNL, it will be transferred to retain earning. Shareholders will eye this account. They will have dividend expectations, which is wrong because this revaluation gain is just a gain on paper. What am I doing? I'm just getting a third party. I'm telling you what, get my land assessed. Get me, get me a revalued amount for my land. So it's 1 million in the books, old value. But right now, as per evaluation model, it's showing 6 million. I have a gain of 5 million, huge gain. If I put it in the PNL, my retain earning will shoot up by 5 million. That's a problem. Why it's a problem? Because there's nobody whom I can hold and say, you know what, that 5 million is my profit, my gain. You owe it to me. Please give it to me. There's nobody like that. It's not a realized gain. It's an unrealized gain. It's just a gain on paper. It's just a gain on paper. So because it's not realized, it's not the right place to put it. So is why I put it in the OCI. That's the best place to put it. Okay. So revaluation gain, revaluation gain would go and sit in my OCI. Okay. And then from OCI, because of course the gains or losses eventually will go and sit in my balance sheet. So it's not transferred to retain earnings, but it's transferred to another place in my balance sheet only called revaluation service and this is a non-distributable reserve meaning shareholders are not going to expect any dividend from this account so it's a gain account only like gain or loss account like retain earning is a gain or loss account revaluation surplus is also gain or loss account but specifically made for this purpose it's a non-distributable reserve okay so second point i'd like to give you under this is that take the gain to oci from oci it's transferred to retain earnings. Okay. Now, if there is a loss, can you all tell me where the loss goes to? Can you put it in the chart? Take the loss. That's absolutely correct. I'm glad most of you have answered it correct. You will take the loss to PNL. Okay. Now, you might have a question that gain went to OCI while loss is going to PNL. It's a valid question. See, in the case of gain, we were playing safe. If you may have heard of another important concept of accounting, just like we have done business entity concept, accruals concept, there's another important concept of accounting called prudence concept. In prudence concept, we play safe. In anticipation, we never book profits and assets, but in anticipation, we do book losses and liability. So in anticipation, uh, I'm not booking any profit. But yes, because I anticipate a loss, I am ready to take it to PNL. I'm ready to take it to PNL because of the prudence concept. Okay, so take the loss to the PNL. Take the loss to the PNL. Now, this was when you were doing the revaluation for the first time. Now, understand one thing that after first time, when whenever you do the revaluation, that is after first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, what do you do when there is a gain? So you might say that, okay, you know what? If second time revaluation has happened, let's do the same thing that you did first time. Let's take the gain to OCI. No. Take the gain. You might get annoyed by listening to this, but there is a reason. Just be patient. Take the gain to PNL up to any amount of previous loss and remaining. 
to OCI. Okay, what does this mean? Now, I showed you that if this is gain, take it to OCI. Now, why am I changing my words? Why am I saying let's take the gain to PNL? Okay, I'll explain you this with, with the help of a numerical. Let's imagine that first time you did revaluation, there was a loss of 5 million. Second time you did revaluation and there is a gain of, say, 20 million. So you might say that, you know what, it's a gain, let's take to OCI. No, the loss is up to any amount of previous loss. And previously when I did revaluation, there was a loss on this. So first 5 million gain will go to my PNL and remaining 15 million gain will go to my OCI. Okay, only remaining 15 million gain will go to OCI. What's the point of doing this? Because if earlier there is any loss sitting pertaining to this asset in my retail earnings, and right now if there is a 20 million gain sitting in OCI, it's not making sense again sitting in retail earnings and the remaining, you know, a loss sitting in retail earnings and again sitting in 20, 20 in, you know, uh, uh, revaluation surplus. This is not making sense. You will want to have a net impact at one place, a net impact. So it's why you will reverse the first impact, which means that, 5 million, which is sitting in my retain earnings as loss, I'll remove it. Whatever remains, 15 million as a gain will reflect in OCI, the net impact. That's it. This is what it means. Okay. So, revaluation gain. So, revaluation gain, I hope you all understood the rule that why, I, why, I, why did I say that, you know what, first take the gain to PNL and then remaining to OCI. Uh, same goes for loss, same law will be applied. I'm giving you 30 seconds, not 30, that's too short, one to two minutes. Go through it, understand, absorb it. If you'll have doubts, put it in the chat box. Okay, so I already have a doubt coming and can you explain after first time again? So if there are any other doubts, please ask. I'll solve Ashna's doubt also in a minute. But please try to absorb this. If you have any doubt, please ask. Okay, so you all just want me to explain again, right? So I'll explain again, okay. So first time revaluation, what did I say? I said, if you're doing the first time revaluation and if it's a case of a gain, what do you do guys if it's a case of a gain when you when it's first time revaluation? Take that gain to OCI. Why did I specifically say take it to OCI? Because I said that it's just a gain on paper. I have not sold that building. I have not sold that land to anyone so that I can claim that profit. I cannot claim it from anyone. It's just a revaluation that I did and basis that I say I have a profit. So if I do that and if I put it in the PNL, there is a problem because it will hit my retain earnings. And if it hits the retain earnings, it's a distributable reserve. From there, I give dividends. So shareholders will expect a higher amount. It's not fair. I did not realize this gain. So it's not fair. Is why I take it to another statement called OCI, other comprehensive income, which is nothing but a continuation of PNL. But from here, the items will not directly hit retain earnings. They'll hit in other reserves. Like for revaluation gain or revaluation loss, it's hitting my revaluation surplus account. It's hitting my revaluation surplus account. It's not hitting the retain earnings. Okay. So that's first thing. Now, after first time revaluation, when I have a gain, I am, my normal rule is to take it to OCI, but I'm saying, no, don't take it to OCI. First, take it to PNL. And only remaining amount, only remaining amount up to the extent of previous loss, whatever you have reversed, only remaining will go and sit in OCI. What this mean, means, I gave you all a numerical example. You did first time uh, revaluation and I said you got a, say, loss of minus 5 million. Okay. But second time you did revaluation and you got a gain of 20 million. Now, you can take that gain 20 million straight away to OCI. But what will it mean? That in your revaluation surplus, 20 million will sit and in the retail earning, a loss of 5 million will sit. So, Pertaining to the same asset, two different impacts, loss and again sitting at two different places. You, you are not getting a net impact. So to best is to net it off. Meaning if you have a 20 million gain, earlier what was the case? Earlier there was a case of uh, a loss recorded, right? A loss recorded. Up to how much? Up to 5 million. So go take that 5 million and put it in PNL so that it's reversed. And remaining 15 million only will act as a net gain in my OCI, which means in my revaluation so. Now I'm doing an example numerical, so it just gets better for you. Asset was purchased for 10 million while it had a life of 10 years. It got revalued. Just one and a half seconds. So sorry, asset was purchased for 10 million while it had a life of 10 years. It got revalued after one year to 18 million. There is no change in remaining life. So this is 
not a numerical example of that. This is in our case. Okay. Yeah. So one more as a concept in, under evaluation that you will have to understand is transfer of excess depreciation. What does it mean? With the help of this numerical, we'll understand what does this concept of transfer of excess depreciation mean. It's very easy. They're saying we had an asset worth 10 million and life 10 years. And they're saying it got revalued after one year to 18 million. Now, I want you all to first find the old depreciation before any revaluation took place. What would the old depreciation be at any given point of time? 10 million is historical cost divided by 10 years. What would the old depreciation be? 1 million per year. 1 million per year. Correct. And now, what is the new depreciation? The new depreciation is because there is a new value to it, 18 million. And the remaining life is how much? After one year, right? So, nine years is my remaining life. So my new depreciation is 2 million. Now, there is a problem. What's the problem? See, in old depreciation, only 1 million as an expense was hitting my retain on. Okay? Only 1 million as an expense was hitting my retain earnings. But as per new depreciation, as per uh, the new depreciation because of change in life, 2 million, that extra, there is an extra 1 million inside this. There's an extra 1 million inside this which is hitting my retain earnings. Now, shareholders can get angry. Shareholders can get angry, okay? They can get mad. Why will they get mad? Because they will say that when there was a gain, you put all the gain to account called revaluation surplus. The gain part, that money you're not giving us. You're putting in revaluation surplus. But all the expenses, all the expenses you're putting in retain on this. So they'll say this is not fair. So if they have a complaint, if they have a complaint, then you can have a policy of transfer of excess depreciation policy. Transfer of excess depreciation policy. Uh, meaning... In your retain earnings, if 2 million depreciation is sitting, okay, meaning it will actually drop your retain earnings by 2 million, right? It's a loss. It will drop your retain earnings by 2 million. So they'll have a complaint that only 1 million should have it. So what we'll tell them, okay, you know what? If you have a complaint like that, let me from revaluation surplus, let me from revaluation surplus, remove the gain of 1 million, remove the gain of 1 million and add it over here and add that 1 million gain over here. So, automatically minus 2 plus 1, only 1 million expenses hitting the retain earning. Only 1 million expenses hitting the retain earning. Because all the revaluation surplus is having revaluation gain. So, from that revaluation gain every year, keep deducting that extra, that extra depreciation and keep putting it in retain on. So, you will have net impact same. This is every year. Till that asset is there, it is every year. Okay. Now, what is the journal entry? What could a journal entry for this look like? So, you will have a journal entry for transfer of excess depreciation as debit, revaluation surplus, and credit retain on. Okay, so this is your transfer of excess depreciation policy. All this is there in your cheat sheet. So if you have to retain it every every time, every day, just give a one to two minute read to that IS-16 cheat sheet. Okay, just one to two minute read. That's it. That's it. Disposal of NC is the last topic that I'm covering under IS-16. After that, I move to the SBR style question, which is on the small side. It's not long. I've picked a very small question, but it's my actual real SBR past question. Okay. Now, disposal of non-current assets, the last topic. Very easy. What do you do in disposal of non-current assets? Nothing. Take the sales proceeds, compare it with the carrying value. Selling price, compare with the cost. You get a gain or loss. That's it. So we'll do a numerical example here. Okay. Asset was purchased on 1st January 2014 for 20 million and it had a life of 20 years. Okay, simple figures again. Simple figures again. Asset was purchased for 20 million on 1st Jan 2014 and life was 20 years. On 1st Jan 2016, which means full of 14 pass, full of 15 pass. So this is after two years. On 1st Jan 2016, asset was sold for 25 million. What is the gain or loss on disposal? Okay. So very quickly, I can do it away. I don't even need an Excel for this. So always you'll know when I have to find a gain or loss, you will compare the selling price. So selling price was how much? 25 million. Carrying value at date of sale 
is how much that I'll have to calculate. Okay, so for that I'll have to go to the historical cost. So how much is historical cost? Historical cost is twenty million. Less depreciation, I'll have to remove. So twenty by twenty into how many years depreciation I'll remove? Two years. So that's going to give me two million. So carrying value at the date of sale is eighteen million. So when I compare it, I have a gain. Gain of how much? Seven million. Okay. Where will I book this gain? In my retain earnings. Okay. And at this point, once I've sold the particular asset, and if this was an asset which was on revaluation model, then any gain sitting inside the revaluation surplus, I, you all remember I told you it's an unrealized gain, so don't put it in retain earnings. So any gain at this point, if it's sitting in revaluation surplus, then from revaluation surplus, transfer it to your retained earnings because now it becomes a realized gain, right? After you've sold that asset. So this is your transfer entry for. Okay, so this is it. With this, we come to an end to I-16. Not very short, not very long. I would call this a medium-sized chapter, okay? We have chapters which are much longer than this, double or triple the size. We have chapters which are much shorter than this, one-fourth of this. So neither too long, neither too short. This was on the medium side, okay? The last thing for the day that remains is drilling the SBR style question. So drafting is very important, linking the knowledge with what examiner expects. What I did right now was your FR level. Same thing you've done in your FR. So no big deal, okay? How do you do this knowledge placement for SBR purposes? is what is important to look at. Okay, so there's a question in your book of Kaplan kit called Cloud. Okay, it's a section B question called Cloud. It's, it was a past question. So pick that from where you can go and take your Kaplan kits in your groups, in your paid WhatsApp groups, there is a link for books in the description of the group. Go to the description of the group, go to books, click the books, inside the books, you have a link for your uh, SBR and inside SBR, you have a link for um, your Kaplan kit, okay? What I'm looking for you all is your free WhatsApp group, just a second. Okay, the link has come, so I'll share it with you all one second. I will explain the last point again, don't worry. So first guys, I have shared the WhatsApp group, the free WhatsApp group. Are you all able to see that? Are you all able to see the free WhatsApp group? Or still you all are facing problems? Okay, great. So I hope you all are able to join this group without any glitches. Yeah. So one of you all want me to explain the last point again in my PPT. Okay. Book link is not there, you're saying, in the group description? Is that what you all are saying? That the book link is not there in the group description? Let me, let me check myself. I'm supposed to be there. Asha is there but not working. Okay. 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 So I will talk to the admin team to reactivate it if that's the case. Maybe you all can put it in the group also. Give a reminder to the, to the admin team. Okay. So if one student has been able to access could be, yeah, could be an individual person's issue. So I'll just repeat how to go and get your books. So in your group description, go to your group description. In your group description, there's a link. There are many links out there, right? So there should be a link for books. Towards the end, almost the third last link is the link for books. So click that and inside that, go to SBR. Okay. And in SBR, go and download your Kaplan kits. I'm not... I'm much interested in the study text, but I'm interested in the kits. 
प्लीज डाउनलोड कर Yes, Ramya. So the profit or loss on sale will go to your PNL. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. I'll add that in the PPT itself because it's eventually going to my retain earning, right? So it's traveling from PNL for sure and going. Yes. Okay. Coming back to the question. So guys, just in case you are not able to access the question. Uh, it's completely okay. I mean, y'all can take your time after the end of the class. Y'all can go peacefully sit and try to access that link. However, like I said, I'm just flashing a very small part of this cloud question. There are three, you know, paragraphs in cloud uh, question. I've just taken one paragraph because only one paragraph is pertaining to I-16. Always in your SBR exam, you will see the questions which are amalgamation of two to three standards. So today I've just covered I-16. So nowhere I'll find a question which is completely around I-16. I can't do that. Okay. So always our approach will be that from past questions, we'll just pull, pull the relevant chunk and crack it. Pull the relevant chunk and crack it. Okay. So yes, your section B question, if you check in the index, there is a cloud question. And in the cloud question, there are three paragraphs. I'm just solving the last paragraph. Okay. This is the requirement of that question. This is the requirement of that question. I'll read the requirement and then the case study. Anybody who wants to volunteer to read the requirement in the case study can raise hands. Anyone wants to volunteer? Show you all a board hearing my voice. Anyone who wants to volunteer, please raise hands. Okay. I don't think so. Anyone is ready. Cool. Fine. I'll only read it. So requirement is explain with suitable calculations how the above transactions should be dealt with in the financial statements for the year ended 31st December 2021 and discuss the ethical and professional issues raised. So understand that question number, so you have four questions in your SBR and question one is your uh, uh, group question. I had given you all the paper structure yesterday. Question two will always be around ethics and accounting issue, ethics and accounting issue. Okay, so this is your question number two style. Okay, of your past question. This is your question two style. And you can see is why they are talking about or they are pointing out ethical issues as well. Now, ethics as a concept is not something that I have catered today, right? I have just catered IA 16. But towards this week only, when you finish the milestone of this week, in this week, you all, are, you all have a target. You all are supposed to watch some certain chapters and come before the next live class. So in the next live class itself, I'm catering questions on whatever you've studied today okay i mean not today this week and i will introduce ethics questions also to you all okay so ethics pertaining to this paragraph is not what we are cracking we are cracking however the accounting issues in it so they are saying explain with suitable calculations look at the question word it's not saying calculate it's saying explain with suitable calculations so you have your question word explain, which is highly important. It's a discursive element. You have to discuss and not just give numbers. Now, if this was a four mark element and suppose you had just done the numbers and come, you wouldn't have passed because probably for the numbers, there was just one mark. The three marks out there would be purely for explaining. And if you wanted to pass this question, you had to explain. You can't just solve and come. Okay, so explain with suitable calculations how above transactions should be dealt within the financial state. Okay, so what is above happening? Let's read that. Now, it's giving a sub case of revaluation of property, plant and equipment. Great. What is that? Cloud purchased an item. I might just zoom it a little bit more so that it's clear for everyone. Cloud purchased an item of property, plant and equipment for 10 million on 1st January 2020. Great. I don't see any problem. This is just a fact. The useful economic life was estimated to be five years. Still fine. At 31st December 2020, which means after one year, the asset was revalued to 12 million. Okay. Another fact. At 31st December 2021, this is the end of second year then. First Jan, they made the purchase, I think. So if they say 31st December 2021, then this is the second year end. The assets value had fallen to 4 million. So there is a downward revaluation. First, there was a revaluation up to 12 million upwards. Now there is a downward revaluation. Okay. Next. The downward revaluation was recorded in OCI. 
they are telling us they are telling us that as a treatment what was done by them is that they have recorded the downward revaluation in oci now the deal is they are asking us to explain what should have happened pertaining to this case study they have already done something around it okay now what will our responsibility be here that bases the facts from here to here they have stated some facts right till these first three lines what treatment have they done is it correct or not they are saying that till the 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 the, the atharva the assets value fall into common yeah so till this point what up to the three statements what they have what should have happened and what they have done was this correct or not we'll go and make a check okay so let's do that but i have to also explain it right so for me to be able to explain it i'll have to first quickly put in the numbers so i understand what's happening okay so let's do it this way first time a revaluation happened whenever a revaluation happens my let the starting point be your revaluation a revaluation happened up to 12 million right so let the starting point for your calculation sake always be the revaluation point it's then easy to develop your figures okay so revalued valuation or let it be short forms in the short forms revalued amount at 31st december 2020 is how much is it 12 okay short forms you will not write full 12 million just this much so always compare the revalued amount with the carrying value at revaluation date so carrying value at revaluation date would be some figure which is not straight forward i'll have to find it because i'll have to go to historical cost so historical cost was how much give a quick check historical cost was 10 million so you will do a less depreciation and less depreciation would be 10 million divided by life is 5 so minus 2 million so that's giving me a carrying value of 8 million okay now when i compare the 8 million and 12 million when i compare the revalued amount at revaluation date 8 million and 12 million what is this is this a case of a gain or a loss guys is this a case of a gain or a loss put it in the chat box quickly revaluation loss or a revaluation gain yes perfect that's a revaluation gain and it's a revaluation gain of a very simple straight forward 12 less a four million Okay, so there is a four million gain now. Now my story doesn't end here because they have happened to do a revaluation at second year also. So revalue amount at thirty first December twenty twenty one. That is coming up to four million. Okay, now when I have a revalued amount, I'll have to immediately compare it with the carrying value at that date. So carrying value at thirty first December. Or 2020. So for that, I'll have to from my previous most recent value remove depreciation. So less depreciation will be 12 by remaining life. What is my remaining life in this case? The useful was five earlier. One year has passed, so it's four. So my depreciation is coming up to less three million, which means my carrying value is nine. So when I compare my nine million and when I compare my four million. how much is the gain or a loss guys what is it is it a revaluation gain or is it a revaluation loss when i compare my carrying value 9 million pay attention what i'm asking when i compare my value in the books 9 million and when i compare the value in the market which is 4 million is this value increasing or is this value decreasing it's a loss right it's clear it's a loss So it's a loss revaluation loss of five. Now, if you may recall, when you're doing the revaluation the first time, and if it's a case of a gain, where do you take the gains to, guys? Do you all recall? Where do you take the gains to? P N L or O C I? You take it to O C I. But any time after the first time, if you're doing, you will check if it's loss first. you will see if there is any gain in oci is there a gain in oci yes there is a gain in oci how much gain is there in oci 4 million so only up to the extent of how much of this loss you can take to oci only 
yeah so first set it off against the oci again right so how much is the gain sitting in oci 4 million so out of 5 million loss i'll take 4 million to oci and remaining has to go in my pnl one remaining has to go in my pnl 1 million what they did above here is they're saying they took the downwards devaluation was recorded in oci they have uh, done the downward revaluation completely in oci they have not done any recording in pnl so that's a problem. That's a problem because my PNL is then showing profits higher by one million. My PNL is showing profits higher by one million. Now, if I just do this calculation and come, and if this was out of four marks, I wouldn't have got the passing mark because it's about explaining mainly. If I want to pass, I'll have to quickly be able to explain this in words. This is where the difference in SBR and your FR lies. Okay, this is where the difference in SBR and FR lies. So let's quickly explain this point by point. Okay. I told you that as a good consultant, what is expected out of you to be able to state the standard and to be able to say that what the standard is telling, not your words, not your words. This is a law or the standard saying this and so and so. So first of all, uh, which standard am I going to relate it with? We have just studied it today. Can you all tell me the number of the standard in the chat box or the name of the standard? Which standard are we talking about? Yes, it's IS-16. So it's easy to write IS-16 instead of writing the whole word property plan and equipment, right? So I'll choose to write IS-16. So I, as for IS-16, first time, first time revaluation again should go to OCI. However, if it is second time revaluation and if it is a loss, then the loss should first go to CI up to the extent of previous gain and remaining loss should go to PL. Okay, so you can see that I have written what IE16 says, but if you go and try to match it with my PPT, or if you go and try to match it with the bare standard or the cheat sheet, exact word by word, it's not same, but in essence, it means the same, right? So this is what is expected out of you in the exam. Just explain what IE16 is saying. Now, IE16 says a lot. IE16 says what the definition says, the recognition criteria says, the initial measurement says about the subsequent. Am I talking everything what IE16 says? No, of course not. I'll get a zero mark for writing all that. And I'll fail the entire paper because I've put entire energy in explaining what IA-16 says. That's not required. What IA-16 says pertaining to this particular issue is only what I'm going to say. Okay. So I'll just quote exact what is needed out of that entire big was standard. Okay. Second point. I'm going to apply. Okay. So I've stated the standard. Now I'm going to apply the standard. So I'll apply it. Um... Okay, so the carrying value of the asset during the revaluation on 31st December 2020 is 10 million less is historical cost 10 million less depreciation because you have to explain the examiner what calculations you're doing. So you'll have to show in the bracket 10 by 5. Yes, 10 depreciation, 10 by 5. depreciation. There's 2 million depreciation, which is 8 million. And the same is compared to the revalued amount the same date we have a gain of 4 million how do we have a gain of 4 million because we'll show the comparison that is when we compare the 12 million less the 8 million that's how we have this gain. show it in the bracket third the asset is revalued in the second year end up to 4 million the carrying value at this date is 9 million. How 9 million? Show the examiner 12 million less depreciation 
3 million. Okay. This leads to a revaluation loss of 5 million. How? Show the examiner the comparison. 9 million plus 4. Then carrying value and the valued amount are compared. Okay, I will answer your question. I, I, I can see there's a question in the chat box. So I'll explain you. Oh, don't worry. However, this is not reducing balance method. <clears throat> okay, so this is my third point. Uh, now, fourth point. As we have already a revaluation gain of 4 million sitting in OCI, the loss up to 4 million will go in OCI. And remaining loss of 1 million will go in PNL. Okay, so you have said what is required basis this case study now they have not done this they have put entire thing in oci now there was a question which asked you to point out ethical issues also we have not done ethical but if four marks were there for accounting and if you write these four points i believe you are exact you're going to get the complete four marks because examiner can't expect you to write more than this for the four mark you've you've done everything what was required okay you've done everything just for the ethic part in the ethics section you could have mentioned that because because the Everything is getting recorded in the OCI. The PNL is overstated. Okay, so you just want because you're scared that if you're making if you're making good quality four points or not, you could do an extra point also. So I'll go ahead and do that extra point on the safe side. Let's do that one extra point. That's not a problem. But don't write too many extra points because then you're wasting time. Okay, then you're wasting time. So let's do that one extra point to conclude. Okay, so what I uh, okay I'll show you I'll show you but just so yeah. Um, uh, in this case, they have not taken the loss to PL. As a result, the pro the profit in PNL is understated or overstated by one million. Can you all tell me if one million loss is not going to my PNL? Is my profit understated or overstated as a result? Yes, that's correct. So in this case, they have not taken the loss to PNL. As a result, the profit in PNL is overstated by. So just in case there was one weak point out of out there, the last fifth point would have then grabbed me the mark. Okay. So sometimes to play safe, what you can apply as a concept is SAC. S meaning state, A apply. And C conclude. So this helps you maximize your marks. Just in case you don't have a strategy out there, then the strategy works. So if you can see the first point is just stating the standard. First point is stating the standard. Point two to four is applying of that standard. And the fifth point is concluding that standard. That what as a result is happening. So this will always help you maximize your marks. If you're short or you don't have a strategy in your head to how to get the maximum marks, the strategy normally works. Okay, now there are questions or doubts. I will crack one by one quickly, all of those. So Lorin asked that why did we use a reducing balance method when the question didn't specify which method to use? So dear, it was not reducing balance. We have used straight line only. Okay, I have used a depreciation first on 10 million. Later on, I have used depreciation on 12 million, uh, not 12 million. Uh, one second. First, I used depreciation on 10 million. Then my new carrying value was 12 million. After that, my new carrying value after depreciation became 9 million. So I used then depreciation on 9 million. Agreed. Why did I do all this? You can see, you can understand this much better with this table, right? Why did I do all this? Now, this is because this is because here uh, the valuation got changed. If I'm using a revalued method, then I can't take depreciation on the historical cost. See, I took depreciation on the historical cost in the first instance at 10 million. Now, if no new revaluation had taken place, then always this historical cost 10 million is only what I would have been using again and again, again and again for depreciation purposes. But a revaluation took place. Okay, a revaluation took place. And what was the revalued amount? 12 million. 
So after this, till the time no new revaluation takes place, my depreciation will always be on 12 million. Till no new depreciation takes place. Great. Thanks. Now, second doubt. Aren't we supposed to transfer the excess depreciation from revaluation surplus to retain earning? Then we have only 3 million to be offset the loss. Okay. So the policy of transferring of excess depreciation that is there is at the discretion of the management. Okay. If they find that the crowd of the shareholders are not satisfied, they're on the complaining side, then they can have this policy, but it's not compulsory. So as a question, till the question doesn't mention that there is a transfer of excess depreciation policy, you will never do the transfer of excess depreciation. Okay. This is always at the discretion of management. Okay. If you want, I'll write it over here that it's at the discretion of management. It's only if the question mentions you will do transfer of excess depreciation, not always. So at management's discretion, only if question mentions. Okay, I hope this helps. Cool. Now, what other doubts do we have? Okay, mostly I don't see any other doubt. So anyone else still has a doubt around the IS-16 or the numerical that we cracked right now? This was question two and this was just one third or I would say one fourth of my question number two, which was 20 mark. This was, you can see it was a 20 mark question and I've just cracked a four mark element, okay, of my SBR. I wanted to in the first class itself, y'all should have had, had the flavor of what an SBR question is like. So this is how it is like, okay. Now during the week when you practice the content or you go through the content, There'll be many more elements that you will co be coming across, right? And at the end of the week, of course, I am coming back to practice more exam cell questions. Any more doubts? Okay, great. So guys, I'll put it in the group also. All those who are my students out here, I'll put it in the group also that this week exactly what you're supposed to watch and come. Not that you're not aware of. In the planner, everything is very well mentioned. But as a reminder, I'll put it again in the group. Okay, again in the group. That's fine, Ashna. You can ask all the questions. You might think your questions are lame, but trust me, when you type in those questions, there'll be so many others will be thinking, you know what? Oh, that's exactly my question. So don't worry. Just don't worry. Okay. So what am I expecting you all to watch and come is IA 16, IS 36 and IFRS 5, government grants, borrowing cost, intangible assets, investment property, inventory, agriculture. Okay. Now, so many chapters out here are very small on the tiny side. What you did of IA 16, there's just one-fourth of that. Okay, there's just one-fourth of that. That agriculture, inventory, uh, borrowing cost, government grants. Four chapters together will make IS-16. They're that small. Okay, so don't worry. IS-36, IS-5 are decent. They're half of what IS-16 is. Yeah, there are videos on ethics and conceptual framework. So next class, whatever I've done... I have given you for the current week to watch and come the asset family. Uh, you all can open your planners. I'll on the, you can see the study planner is uploaded on your portal, preview it, download it rather than keep it. So deadline for you all to watch for 22nd March. Can you all see what is the deadline for you all to watch before you all come for the live class this is the live class the last column 23rd march so before you come for 23rd march 22nd march whatever i have asked you all to watch and come by 22nd march questions on that i'll try to crack crack question practice on asset block okay so i'll i'll pick one question which is a combination of one to two you know standards on ice uh, you know uh, on my asset family and has ethics element also so i'll explain ethics as a new concept ethics will be explained to you all as a chapter as a topic and Past question practice on a combination of asset and ethics, which is question number two. You will crack. It's the question number two of your paper. Okay. So I'll remind you all every day that every day what you all can cover up. So tomorrow probably you all can cover up before 22nd of March. You all can cover up tomorrow in payment. Then for second day, you all can keep IFRS 5. Then government grants, borrowing cost, intangibles. Three can happen in one day. Investment inventory agriculture again three can happen in one okay so if you have a doubt on the recorded lectures the best place to post the doubt is okay my i was not sharing the screen why didn't you all tell me i was flashing my planner 
Wow. Anyway, yeah, the planner is in front of you. I believe you can see it now. The deadline to watch 22nd March are this asset family chapters. The live classes on 23rd March. Before 23rd March, you'll have to watch all this and come. Yeah. Uh, in case you have a doubt, the best way to ask the doubt is put it on the group. So everyone benefits from your question, not just you. So I'll solve it there. I'll solve your answer on the group. Everyone else will also benefit. Or you can DM me also. That's also That also works. Direct messaging also works. Okay. We are good then. Orientation for uh, SBR because yesterday only we did it and today is Sunday. So I believe the team did not get a chance because for them also this is a weekend, right? So I believe mostly the upload will take place tomorrow. The upload will take place tomorrow. All right. So thank you everyone. Waiting to see you all next week. Please come next week. Don't miss the live sessions. Live sessions are useful than always the recorded sessions, okay? Because you can ask me live whatever doubts you have. So bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone.